uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the IBIS Amy seminar. I am pleased to introduce one of our own, James Zhao, uh, who's a assistant professor in the uh, biomedical data science uh, department here at Stanford. Uh, if you don't know James, just a few um, introductory remarks. Uh, he received his PhD from uh, Harvard in 2014. Um, so another graduate, I don't know if you knew her. <laughs> uh, and uh, so he's been on the faculty for uh, a few years now. And uh, before then he was actually a member of Microsoft uh, Research. Uh, he has already in his early tenure on the faculty um, achieved a number of, of awards. Actually, uh, some of these I think preceded him coming to Stanford. He's a, a Gates scholar, was a Gates scholar, is a Gates scholar at Cambridge and a uh, Simons Fellow uh, at UC Berkeley. And uh, at Stanford, he became a Chan Zuckerberg investigator. Um, he is a faculty director of the, the university-wide program called the AI for Health, which has a number of exciting uh, projects funded by a variety of companies. Uh, the focus of his research is in making machine learning uh, more reliable uh, and uh, human computable and rigorous. Um, his focus uh, is uh, largely on uh, AI for human disease and health. A number of his algorithms are widely used uh, in tech and biotech uh, industries. And uh, today he's gonna be doing a talk that's entitled Computer Vision to Phenotype Human Diseases Across Physiological and Molecular Scales. I look forward to it. Welcome, James. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for the very nice introduction and thanks for organizing this seminar. Great, yeah, so as Daniel mentioned, um, you know, really excited to be here and to, to see all of you. Uh, and for this presentation, I'll tell you about some of the recent work that we've been exploring, right, in applying some of the recent advances in computer vision to study human diseases across different physical scales. And I'll also talk about you know, some of the ways, approaches that we developed on sort of audit and to interpret these computer vision algorithms to make them more reliable and more accountable when we try to deploy them in practice. Right. Um, so maybe just to set the stage right, before I dive into technical details, so I would like all of us here to, to do like a little thought experiment. Right. Um, so you know, on the screen here, right, I've written down for a few standard kind of descriptions of the face of a particular person. Right. Um, and I'd like you to maybe take a few seconds and try to see if you can visualize in your head just based on the descriptions of what you think this person actually looks like. All right, so it's meant to be a pretty hard exercise, but you can try to visualize the person's face in your head. Okay, so now I'm actually going to reveal the actual face, right, uh, so that we can compare with, with your, you know, with your visualizations. So this is actually the face of the person or face on which, based on whom I actually wrote down these this descriptions. So it's actually a pretty, you know, challenging thought experiment, right? Because the, it's, you know, based on the, these written features, it's often very difficult to capture and to capture vividly, right, to this precise face of a particular individual. And there's also a lot of information that's captured in this face, in the picture that's very hard to capture in sort of our natural language or even structured descriptions. Right, so it turns out that this actually particular individual, this photo came from a New England Journal paper from a few years ago. It's a truck driver, right? So there's a few interesting features of this, right? One thing that's interesting is that you, know, you can notice that half of the face is actually quite asymmetric, right? So this half here actually corresponds to basically the the, the side that's exposed to the sun, to the environment, and you can actually looks much older, more wrinkled and sagging compared to the half that's facing inside. Right, so that's one reason why I like this photo, because it actually shows quite vividly this interaction between the environmental exposures and to the underlying genetics biology of this individual that informs his health status. The other reason why I thought this picture is interesting is that it actually quite vividly shows just how much more information there is in the vision, right, if I looking at some image compared to other kinds of standard descriptions that we can capture through text or through natural language. So of course, this is sort of already the case for something that's quite familiar to all of us uh, with sort of looking at faces of individuals, right? we all have a lot of experience with that. 
Um, and I think this is even more so the case when we look at objects maybe that are less familiar to our human vision, right? So things like you know, ultrasound or cancer biopsies or even phenotypes of individual cells. And this is really where I think in a lot of the really interesting applications advances in computer vision comes in is precisely in these settings where it's hard for human vision and hard for human language to really kind of quantify and capture these phenotypes. And the goal here is to use computer vision as basically like a new language to extract and to learn the morphology and the biology and the disease of these different objects across different physical biological scales. And in particular, you know, something that my group is particularly interested in is really trying to capture more of temporal and spatial structures right, in these kinds of images, in these kinds of data. So a lot of the advances that we would like to leverage and extend really coming from computer vision, right? There's a lot of the recent progress in computer vision, especially for more temporal data, right? And you know, a lot of the efforts in my group as well, especially actually also on developing uh, some of these core machine learning algorithms to interpret and to leverage these temporal kinds of data. Um, so basically for this, presentation, um, I'd like to just discuss with you and explore with all of you together, you know, a couple of specific applications where we actually use these computer vision algorithms to, you know, to study sort of two types of data, right? One is actually looking at sort of ultrasound videos of the heart, where we want to look at different phenotypes and start cardiac diseases. So this is more trying to capture the temporal structures. So the second one is actually trying to capture more spatial structures where we're actually using computer vision to basically to study uh, histology images to essentially see if we can read off molecular profiles directly from these histology images. Um, and then the second part of the talk, I want to tell you about you know, some of the ways we've been exploring to how do we to, to make these kind of computer vision and medical AI algorithms more accountable uh, and more uh, reliable when we should deploy them in practice. So deployment is actually something that we're actively working on now for all of the, for both of these algorithms that I'm that I'll describe. So that's actually a big topic in the group. So please feel free to to stop me if you have any questions at any time. Uh, happy to happy to discuss throughout the talk. Okay. So I'll start by um, so sort of almost like a warm up example by telling you about you know, some work that we've been doing recently which is actually looking at um, videos, ultrasound videos of the, of the human heart. Right? So this is work that's led by uh, David, who is, who is a terrific former postdoc in my group, uh, and then Brian, who's currently a, a CSPC student in the group. Uh, and it was published in this paper in Nature a few months ago. So the motivation for this project um, is that you know, heart disease, as many of you know very well, is still the leading cause of death in the US. Right? It's responsible for one in four deaths. And these kind of ultrasound, cardiac ultrasound videos is still one of the most common imaging techniques that people use to study and to quantify how well the heart is functioning. Right? So here's an example of this ultrasound from which the cardiologist, the clinicians will be able to derive scores like ejection function, which is sort of measures how well the heart is functioning. So these cardiac ultrasound, which is also called echocardiograms, is routinely used, right? So there are over 10 millions of these done every year in the US, and they're not cheap, right? So each one will cost over, potentially over a thousand dollars. So here I'm showing you sort of four different these, of these ultrasounds from four different patients taken here at Stanford. And just to show you what, like, what are some of the subtle variations you can see in these videos, right? So it's a, it's a quick primer, right? So basically what's, the sonographer, the cardiologist looking at here, when they try to interpret the videos, they're basically looking at this top chamber here, the left ventricle chamber, right? And effectively what they're doing, right, is that they're going through the video, they identify the frame, right, where this chamber is the largest, they'll trace that out. They'll identify the frame where the chamber is the smallest, they'll trace that out, right? And then based on the volumes and the tracings, to, there's a formula which they can compute this thing called ejection fraction. Right, so basically, if you think of the heart as a pump, right? So how well the heart is functioning is really measured by how you know how much power is generating. So by looking at the changes, the contractions from the largest to the smallest, that gives us sort of a standard measures of how how well um, the, the cardiac performance. So you can imagine this process is actually quite 
manual, it's quite labor intensive, right? Because you have to actually go through the video to find the individual frames and put all the tracings and then do the final calculations. So that's why it's partly why it's quite expensive. It's time consuming. And there's also a lot of heterogeneity across different clinicians. So two different clinicians looking at the same video often arrive as different calculations. So this motivates why uh, you know, this our, our uh, project, right? You no. Know, Currently, it's really we're heavily relying on pure human vision to do all of those steps for assessing the cardiac function. So our motivation is to see, okay, can we actually develop computer vision algorithms that also look through these videos, right? And then try to calculate things like ejection fracture and do these other quantifications like heart failure. And this is basically the algorithm that we developed, which I'll describe in a little bit in the next few slides, right? So the algorithm will take its input, right? This standard kind of cardiac ultrasound videos. And then it segments out the chamber, the relevant chamber of the heart, right? So it keeps track of that over time. And in real time, it actually assesses and computes the ejection fraction for every beat of the heart. So that's the input and output of the algorithm. So here's a little bit more about the technology in a little bit more detail, right? Um, so I just want to, so the, the, the actual technology details are less important, but I want to give you some of the high level design principles here of you know, how, why we designed it the way we did. So the main thing is that it takes us inputs by right, these kind of cardiac ultrasound videos. And the main thing you notice is that there are actually two branches in these algorithms, right? So there's a bottom branch here, which is actually trying to mimic what the clinician is doing, right? When she's segmenting out the, the chamber Basically, the algorithm in the bottom here is doing this following every step, right? So it's taking each frame of the image and also segmenting out where the relevant chamber of the heart is and computing the volumes and all of that. And the top arm is basically a particular kinds of spatial temporal convolution, right? It's basically actually looking across the video, looking for both spatial and temporal structures in order to assess the cardiac function. And the reason why I actually have these two arms is that basically it ends up being quite useful to have this temporal segmentation in the bottom here is effectively as a way to focus the tension and to regulate the tension of the model. Right? So the model actually looks through these, uses these, these segmentations to make an assessment of the ejection fraction and other heart cardiac functions for every individual beat. Right? And then all of that is aggregated together at the very end to assess, to make a patient level assessment for ejection fraction, to predict heart failure, now we can also predict various other functions related to kidney, to liver, a lot of other laboratory values. So that was the high level design principle for this strategy for the algorithm. So the, you know, here are a couple more examples of what the algorithm is actually doing, right? So it works quite well uh, in practice, right? So we tested on Stanford patients, right? So the blue curve here is the AUC curve of Stanford patients. And then to really see how well the algorithm will potentially will work when it's deployed in a different context, what we do is that we actually froze the algorithm, right? So no tuning of any hyperparameters, and we actually shipped it and then tested it on data from a different hospital, from Cedar Sinai. Right? And we're actually very happy to see that even though the, there are quite you know, some differences in how data are collected and processed in different hospitals, the same algorithm that we tested on Stanford also performed basically equally well when it's applied to new patients in Cedars. We also done some additional prospective evaluations by comparing the algorithm to actual clinical uh, assessments and they also work quite well there on new patients. So the other way that we really try to ensure the algorithm is reliable is to see how robust is it to actually to different poor quality data or to noisy videos, right? Because that's sort of a, uh, something that we think is really important if we really want to deploy this in practice. So here's one experiment that we did, which is on the, on the x-axis, basically corresponds to how noisy the data is, right? So the further to the right you go, that means like the more noise there is in the videos, in the input videos. All the way to extreme, then the one extreme here, that means that basically about 50% or half the videos is actually corrupted, right? Half of the pixels are corrupted. The y-axis basically assesses essentially the performance of the accuracy of the model, right? How well does it agree with the ground truth? And here we're also quite reassured to see that even on extremely low quality, very noisy data, right? Um, you no, know, up to half the video is actually corrupted. Um, the performance does not really drop very much, right? It still works at an acceptable level, uh, which also gives us more confidence that the model could work reliably 
uh, in deployment. So this is especially important if we want to deploy these, for example, in, in other contexts, like point of care contexts, like emergency rooms, et cetera. Um, so the, one of the challenges in working on this project is that there's actually not a lot of medical video data sets that's publicly available, right? So for medical imaging, for static images, there's reason to be a lot more data, but for medical videos, I think there's, there's actually relatively little data. So a part of our um, the effort with this project is to really think about how do we build this into a, a useful resource for the broader community of both machine learning researchers and also people who want to work on the medical videos. So we actually released, with, you know, in collaboration with, with Amy, we actually released all of these videos that we worked on. So it's over 10,000 videos, echocardiograms from Stanford patients. So are anonymized, uh, and they also have outcomes, patient information. And I think currently this is actually one of the largest, maybe the largest publicly available medical video data sets. Right? So anyone can uh, go through Amy and to apply for these video data sets. So we hope that this is really becomes a, a broad resource for the broader community. We've also released all of our code and algorithms for people to process, to test our models, and to improve on our approach. Great. Um, any questions before I move on to the, the next example for histology? Yeah, Professor, I have one question. Um, you said that the algorithm uh, was very robust. It performed well when 50% of the pixels are dropped. Um, I'm just curious if this kind of test is indicative of corruption you might see uh, in an actual ultrasound. Um, did you investigate other forms of corruption? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so certainly there, I think there are different axes of how data can change and different types of corruptions. I think this is sort of noisy videos is just one the noise in the video is only one axis of corruption. Oftentimes, for example, there are other quality issues. If you're, if you're not getting the right view of the chamber, that can also lead to mistakes in the model. Um, so we've also evaluated how well the algorithm, how robust the algorithm is along these other axes, which I've not shown here, but uh, I think this is also quite reliable. James, that's a quick question. On that robustness, which is fabulous, do you have an intuition? Because in other AI models in radiology, robustness has not been the case. Do you have a sense for why? Is it the use case? Is it the model architecture or something else as to why the results are robust across centers or noise and position? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Daniel. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that so we were very careful in designing the kinds of augmentations and data augmentations and different regularizations during the training time. Uh, so I think that certainly helped quite a bit, especially with different types of data augmentations that we did. So the other reason why I think um, is that it turns out that I think actually this video data tends to be, in our experience, to be more reliable, more robust than models just trained on static images. Right, because in some sense, there's actually potentially quite a lot of redundancies over this video, right? Because if we're looking at one cardiac video from the patient, um, it's actually across multiple beats. So certainly there's some redundancy there. Um, uh, and even within one beat, right? So the frame rates is certainly can be relatively high in these videos. So there's also a lot of complementary information across the different frames. So that's actually one of the interesting insights is that actually it ends up being, people think of video as being more complex, but there's actually a lot of built-in advantages to work with the video data compared to if I only have one static image. Yeah, this is uh, Sandy, if I can comment. I think that uh, another reason it did well is that this type of noise is really not representative of the kind of noise you would expect in an ultrasound video. So for instance, for those of us who have worked with CT and with uh, chest x-rays and things like that, we don't typically uh, look at robustness by dropping pixels out of the images. We have different uh, smoothing functions or different um, additive white Gaussian noise or the appropriate noise for the modality and that sort of thing. And um, so I, I think it still looks like it would have done very well, but I think that more realistic noise uh, situations uh, are necessary really to make that case. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, as I mentioned, so we did try 
other axes of noisy variations of adding uh, is that in addition to dropping pixels, also adding like noisy pixels, uh, and also changing the difference. See how what well the model works when there are different uh, perspectives on the video, with different views. So well, I think, but I, yeah, I think those are great. Also, the great things to further validate. Yeah, and it's it's not so much uh, technically right or wrong. It's just that the kinds of variations that one would expect and one has to worry about in medicine are really uh, operator errors or operator adjustments or operator choices and not uh, flakiness in the uh, electronics that cause uh, pixels to drop or something like that. That's great. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Which is, yeah, which is why I think even some of the, just getting the right perspective in these videos, that could be, you know, that's definitely that's a realistic challenge in practice. Okay, super. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll then go into sort of the next example, um, which is how do we actually also capture more of the spatial patterns? Right. So here the setup is that uh, we're interested in these uh, histopathology images. So for example, here's an example image taken from breast cancer patients, from a biopsy of breast cancer patients. And typically right, in these pathology clinics, there's sort of two types of workflow. Right, so the standard workflow um, based on sort of HNE staining, then other stainings would be, okay, you take this image, you stain it, and then oftentimes the experienced pathologists will actually look at this image, right, and maybe do some segmentation to see where are the tumor normal regions, and then there's a lot of information they can learn just by, again, by applying experienced human vision to these stained images. In parallel, right, in more recent times, uh, there's also been applications of applying more molecular information, for example, from single cell RNA sequencing or single cell genomics to extract more higher resolution information from these biopsy samples. Right? Of course, I think these two approaches have a lot of complementary strengths and weaknesses. Right? The strength of the, the imaging histology-based approach is first is that I think it's more standard. And you also capture a lot of the information about the heterogeneity and the spatial information in the biopsy, right? Because you actually have this physical tissue right there. The weakness is that actually the, you know, I think you can, oftentimes you don't have, you can't, it's hard to extract too much information from this, right? Especially, uh, at least, especially at the molecular genomic level. In parallel, like the single cell kind of analysis or genomic analysis, right? You get a lot of high depth information, right? For, you know, maybe you can get even readouts for hundreds of genes. Um, however, oftentimes, right, you lose the, a lot of the spatial information, but it's also quite critical for histopathologists. So the motivation for our project is to see, okay, so can we actually use computer vision to get the best of both worlds, right? So we want to have both the capture and retain the spatial information from the images, but also still capture the, you know, the, the high dimensional genomic information. So this is basically uh, the motivation for this new algorithm STNet that we recently published, right? So here's basically just an example application of STNet, right? So the input into the STNet will be the standard H and E histology image, right? And the, the algorithm is basically like an image to image translation, right? So it takes this input, this histology image, and then based on that, it actually generates hundreds of new images. Each new image then corresponds to the spatial gene expression profile of a different gene of interest. Right, so let's say if you're interested in this breast cancer marker of FASN, right, then we'll generate a new image corresponds to the spatial variation of FASN. The yellow regions are where it's highly expressed and the blue is where it's lowly expressed. If you're interested in a different gene, if you're a collagen marker, then it generates a different output image. So based on the same input histology image by itself, right, the algorithm is able to generate hundreds of new images corresponds to spatial variation profiles of different genes of interest. And we've also done experiments, uh, spatial transcriptome experiments to validate that the, the spatial transcriptome profiles generated by the algorithm by STNet actually matches up quite well with the empirical experimental measurements. So we can do this now accurately for over hundred genes. Um, and I think there's a lot of information you can capture here, right? Uh, more high fine grained information. So this is, you know, if you have a different patient, right? Uh, then the algorithm, the same algorithm would then generate sort of a different spatial transcriptome profile. Um, and oftentimes you can actually capture more 
higher resolution spatial variation, right, in different parts of heterogeneity in different parts of the tumor compared to what clinicians would be able to tell based on display their readings of these H and E or the stained images. So this is a paper that's led by uh, Brian uh, and was published or also a few months ago. So I just want to briefly explain the, what is the data that we use to train and to validate these kind of algorithm. Right, so it's based on this spatial transcriptomic technology. So there are several exciting te te technologies now. So we're using actually the technology is pioneered by our collaborator, Joachim Blomberg. The technology is actually quite intuitive, right? So basically you have these little chips, right? So it's like a little chip here. You have each dot on the chip corresponds to a set of probes. And what you do is that you basically overlay this tissue on top of the chip, right? And then these probes would actually basically penetrate into the cells. What's nice about the probe is that each probe is actually contains a barcode. It's a like, sort of essentially like a zip code that tells you the X, Y location of that probe. And when that probe encounters a transcript in the cell, right, the barcode is actually attached to the transcript so that when we do sequencing together of this whole tissue at the end, we actually know the location, the X, Y location of each of the transcripts that we capture. Right, so the output then of this would be for thousands of genes. We have the spatial resolution uh, of you know, up to about 100 microns to see where that transcript is located. Um, and the algorithm itself right, is basically trained on this kind of data, right? So it's taking as input to the histology h &E image and scanning across the image to learn some feature representations for each of these little patches. Right? So each patch is about 100 to 150 microns. Um, and based on those features, that's how it's actually able to generate, right, for each patch, uh, you know, a set of expression values corresponds to the expression profiles of different genes for several hundred genes. Um, so here as before was the, was the uh, so we did with the echo data, right? For the echo data, we also tested it on new patients from a new hospital. Here, we also try to do something that's similar. So it turned out that um, there's a company called 10X Genomics, which actually commercialized this spatial transcriptomic technology. And it's quite fortunate for us that they actually generated in parallel, right? Using very different imaging protocols, using actually different sequencing techniques, so uh, also data from breast cancer patients. So, you know, it's a quite a different data set. So this is actually, I think, quite a stringent test for the algorithm. So we basically froze the algorithm, right? And again, no tuning of the parameters and then apply that to these new patients. Each dot here corresponds to basically one gene, right? So the X, Y axis is basically how well were we able to generate the spatial transcriptome profile for that gene on this new test data set from 10X Genomics. And we are particularly interested in the genes in this top right corner here, right? There's over hundred genes where based on both this external validation and also based on our internal validation, we can actually generate quite accurate spatial profiles. And this includes actually many of the tumor markers as well as sort of immune markers uh, and also genes involved in mobility and architecture. So, the, so the, I think the really power of these kinds of technology is actually even going beyond the experimental measurements where that's possible, right? So certainly doing these experiments is already very expensive and there are only a, sort of a few groups in the world that can really do this in high throughput way. But the experiments are also limited in that, you know, they have this of 100, 150 micron resolutions. And the algorithm, I think, is actually able to perform this sort of like a computational super resolution, right? So within each square, right? Each square is about 150 microns. Uh, the algorithm actually learns we're in the square, right? So this gene, let's say for example, this FASM gene, the tumor marker is actually highly expressed, right? It's able to actually learn that it's really in these regions where you have these enlarged nuclei, particularly that's where we see this, the algorithm believes that we see the highest expression for this gene, right? And we have some also experimental validations using some higher resolution spatial transcriptome data. But I think this is actually quite a powerful approach going forward for really associating sort of expression patterns of individual genes right in their native spatial profile to sort of morphological changes of these genes right in different cellular neighborhood ar ar architectures right, so based on this we have done some initial analysis for example if you can basically just associate you know, which genes uh, expressions are the most associated with the size of the nuclei the elongation of the nuclei you know different measures like density or different geometries Right, uh, and you can really find some quite interesting uh, 
genes uh, and also some interesting discoveries. So the other nice thing about this is that the algorithm, once we've trained it now, you can actually apply that quite readily to archival images, right? So images that have been previously collected. Um, so we have, for example, applied this also to images from histology images from TCGA, uh, where we can use this to quantify things like tumor heterogeneity and also, for example, things like immune infiltration, which are also measures that are quite interesting and important for clinical purposes. This now can also go beyond predicting expressions of genes, right? So we've extended this approach in recent collaborations with Montine Lab in pathology, where we now can also, based on the same kind of h and &E input image, we can also generate different protein stains, right? Also spatial variant protein stains. This is basically an example where we can generate phospho-tau protein tangles, right? Uh, which is also matches up very well with the, the immunohistochemical stains of these proteins. So I think the overall goal here, the overall vision here is really we would almost view this sort of like, a, you know, like Instagram for pathology, right? So based on the, these very commonly available histology images like H and E, right? Now with these algorithms, we can in real time, right? Automatically generate the molecular profiles that the algorithm have been able to read off directly from these images. Um, and, and this can assist clinicians potentially in for example, in prognosis, also in treatment design, right? Uh, because it has a lot of information about the tumor heterogeneity. Also just from the biological, more basic biology perspective, right? So it also provides a way to really study sort of new cellular biology features. For example, how different expressions of genes are linked to their cellular morphologies sort of in these tumor contexts. Okay, so I'll also pause here for a minute to see if people have any questions about this. That's really cool technology, uh, James. I just have a couple questions. So these are H&E images, and I don't know how many different uh, stains you looked at, which are based on you know, targets expressed on the cell surface, if I'm understanding those color maps correctly. Is that right? You know, expression of particular antigens on the cell surface, is that what those maps show that are generated for that, that matrix technology you showed? Yeah, so these are actually the abundance of the MRA transcripts. Oh, okay, it's based on transcripts inside the cell, not <laughs> something expressed on the surface of the cell then. That's just mRNA in the cell, is that right? right? So, so the, this, the question I have is, I don't know how many different ones of those you looked at, but it's a little counterintuitive that just morphology would capture the full range of everything, you know, because the, the hypothesis, the, the explanation for that being able to work is there's a morphological change corresponding for each one of those transcripts that can be, um, you know, uh, uh, deconvoluted, as it were, from the, the yeah. HNE image. Is HNE image is just morphology, it's nothing else. There's nothing. That's no right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think that's a great question. Um, what I'd want to say is that certainly not all the genes are we able to predict, predict accurately the expression for all the genes, right? So we can do this for a subset of about a couple hundred genes now. Okay, okay. Um, and then maybe the question you're asking is, okay, so what's special about those couple hundred genes? Yeah. And these are the genes that, as you expect, are more naturally linked to the morphology. Right? So I think some of the immune markers are okay. more linked to the morphology some okay. of the tumor growth factors, as well as genes that are related to the, the, the cellular architectures, like these exoskeletons, yeah. arch yeah, yeah, yeah. Genes, okay, cool. are more readily visible from the morphology itself. Yeah. And then my other quick question is, how sensitive is this to the registration of the H&E image to that map? In, you know, when you generate it, you put the piece of tissue on the grid, yeah. and then you're gonna, you know, how closely do you have to have in order to get the localization right, I would imagine you've got to get a, a pretty good registration between how the tissue was laid on the grid versus the H and E image where it wasn't on the grid. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, so, so we actually spend a lot of efforts to uh, to make the algorithms robust to errors in registration. So that's perhaps an even bigger issue when we're working on this at the protein level, because the protein level here, you know, these are the H and E and to the Phospho tau IHC are actually not from the same slice, right? These are consecutive slices. So there, there's actually even larger misregistrations. So we've developed 
as a part of the pipeline, various approaches to basically to first finally uh, align them, but also from the machine learning perspective to make the algorithms more reliable to the misregistrations. And just briefly, how do you make them reliable to the misregistration? Because it seemed like the algorithm is going to learn this corresponds to that in terms of morphology features. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we can view them, even the misregistration is sort of like a sort of essentially kind of a weak supervision, right? So it's sort of like a noisy supervision. Okay. Thanks. That's a great comment. Uh, professor, I have a question. So the values we are getting as the, like in the spatial map, are there relative values or their absolute or actual values? Yes. So these are actually, um, here we're actually predicting basically sort of like a normalized expression right. value of each gene. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's what my question. Okay. I had a question about the uh, super resolution that you mentioned. Could you talk briefly about what you think is going on there? Because you know you're basically giving the labeled data, which has resolution of you know ten by ten, and you have a value for the average of all of the cells that are in there. But now you're going in and looking at the activations, basically, and seeing that it's identifying specific features that are at greater resolution than the training data. Is that you know those features are present somewhere in many of the examples that have. Uh, expression of that gene and so it's learned to sort of associate what the commonalities are even if it's at a high resolution or do you think something else is going on? I think that's exactly right yeah so even though the experimental measurements you get one value for each gene for this whole square right? but because there are common features across different squares that the algorithm can learn to pick up that's how we think it's able to actually capture these more higher resolution more fine-grained morphologies like the size of individual nuclei. Yeah, so I think these kind of super resolution approaches is really perhaps one of the more exciting ways to take the, to combine the computer vision with the experimental technologies. Okay, super. These are great comments. Um, so the next step, as we mentioned, right? So we're very excited to actually another to go beyond the sort of the papers and the algorithms to actually really take these algorithms and put them into deployment. And that's an area where we're still actively working on with colleagues at Stanford and also across other hospitals like Cedars to actually try to deploy these algorithms. So what I want to talk about in the next 10, 15 minutes is think about uh, like how are these algorithms actually evaluated for deployment and what are some of the limitations there? All right, so it's so a part of our efforts to try to deploy and to evaluate our own algorithms, AI systems for deployment. We also thought, okay, so maybe we should see more holistically, right? how are AI systems being evaluated for deployment in general? So in a recent work, we actually collected sort of a large database of all the FDA approved AI devices. And in particular, for each of these devices, we extracted information on how exactly was each device evaluated. Right. So here's basically like a summary across all of these 130 approved, FDA approved AI devices, right? They are, they're stratified, we stratified them by which body part they apply to. Maybe the thing that you can focus on is actually the different colors, right? So blue here actually means that this device is actually evaluated across multiple sites, right? For before FDA approval across at least two or more sites. So one thing is actually quite striking is that already there, no, there are many uh, devices that have been approved by the FDA, right? That did not actually report multiple sites performance results, right? So the number of blues is actually relatively small. That's one surprise. So the other quite big surprise is that only four out of these 130 approved devices were actually evaluated prospectively, right? Using sort of prospective studies. So the remaining 126 of them were only evaluated on previously collected data, right? Um, so that's actually quite, a little bit concerning to us, right? Because if we put these two together, right? So you have most of the studies were evaluated only on pro, you know, previously collected data from only one site or a small number of sites. Then from a machine learning, some machine learning researchers, we know that there's actually a lot of potential issues for biases, uh, for overfitting or for uh, the artifacts, right? When that, you, you know, when you're having such limited valuation for evaluation for your devices. Here's just one case study that we did, right? So there are actually four of these algorithms that um, approve, FDA approved algorithms for pneumothorax detection. Uh, no, so we just did a case study to see you know, what are the kinds of biases that you could find, 
right? So we took, a, you know, so we developed our own algorithm, right? Uh, and we have data from three different sites, from Stanford, Baylor, from NIH, three different data sets. So this three by three table just shows you how well did the algorithm that we developed using data from one site, right? How well did it actually work when we applied it to data from other sites? So for example, this 0.88 here, that means that if we take the data from NIH, we trained our, uh, you know, computer vision algorithm, right? And we test that on test patients from NIH, right? It gets a pretty good performance, 0.88. But when we take the same algorithm, let's train on NIH and then deploy that, apply that to test patients at Baylor, then the performance would actually drop off by more than 10%, by 12%, right? So quite, quite substantial changes in the algorithm. Um, the only difference is where you're applying it. So this actually shows that, you know, if you're only really evaluating these algorithms on retrospective data, right, at one site, that can lead to, that can mask a lot of biases and potential artifacts in that data set. Uh, and it doesn't really tell you very much about how well the algorithm will work across different settings, right? Which is why, you know, in our studies, in both studies I mentioned, you know, we were very keen to actually de deploy the algorithm and test it on very different external data. So this also leads to sort of a more general question, right? You know, as machine learning researchers, developers, right? So what can we do to actually really more generally improve the reliability and accountability of these AI systems, especially in our case for these medical AI systems? Um, so I want to tell you about sort of one framework that you know, we've been proposing for thinking about accountability. So first I have to tell you, you know, what does actually accountability mean in the context of machine learning, right? So what you know, I mean are my working definition is that you know, if, I, if I have a system that's accountable, then if the system actually makes mistakes, I want to know exactly where each component of that system actually contributes to that mistake, right? So let's say in the context of machine learning then, right? So the basically two core components of the systems that have some training data, Right? And I have the algorithm learning algorithm itself. It could be a, you know, a big neural network. Right? So if the system actually gets, let's say, 80% accuracy, I would like to know if, it's, you know if this is accountable, I would like to know how much did actually each of the individual components at the highest resolution, right? how much did individual training data points and individual artificial neurons in this network, how much did each of them contribute to that 80% accuracy? Right? So basically, I want to partition that 80% accuracy into some values, right, to each of these artificial neurons and to each of the data points, ideally. And similarly, if the algorithm actually makes mistakes or if it's biased in deployment, I would also like to know which specific data points in my training sets and which specific neurons in the model actually are contributing to those mistakes. Right? Because if I can actually pinpoint those exact culprits, then that makes it easier for me to repair the models and also to interpret, to understand why the models are making these mistakes. Right, so this is our working definition of accountability. So you know, we've been doing a lot of work actually in coming up with a systematic and scalable framework to actually achieve this accountability. So this is based on this framework we're calling the data and neuron Shapley values. So very briefly, so the idea here is that basically we want to you know, assign some responsibilities to each individual component of our machine learning system. And the components here could be both training data as well as internal artificial neurons in the network. And we're basically leveraging off some sort of quite fundamental ideas from economics, uh, where they want to assign sort of credits, you know, in games. So as you imagine, if all of us work together and we've solved some puzzle, then you want to basically split, you know, and you get a bonus. You want to split up that bonus around the individual components, right? So there's turns out there's only one fair way to do this so that people are happy. That's called the Shapley value. So in these series of recent works, we extended this idea to the setting of data, both data and also to the algorithms. So now we can say that, okay, so your data comes work together and also these different neurons work together. So we have a way now to actually assign scores to each of the data points, also to the individual neurons to see how much did they contribute to the final mistakes or the success of the model. So I just want to show you a couple of quick applications of this. Uh, I think this is sort of hopefully uh, you know, gives you a sense of how we can use this to improve accountability of medical AI systems in deployment. So here's one sort of uh, you know, example, pretty simple example. So just, there's been a lot of interest in developing you know, training AI systems for dermatology applications. Right? So training data ends often 
you know, is scraped from the internet from different sources, it can be quite noisy. So these here are some real examples of training data that people use. All right, so that means that when you actually deploy the algorithm actually in clinical settings, people have noticed that there are just too much biases and artifacts and the performance really suffers. With our framework, right? So now remember that we actually have now assigned a numerical score, like a number to each of my training data points to see how much did each individual training data point contribute to how well the model performs in deployment, right? In clinics. And that's actually very useful because if we have particular training data points that are very noisy, the Shafley score is actually going to be low or negative, right? And whereas the data points that have high values, right, ends up being sort of the more interesting or more informative data points. So something that's actually quite easy to do now that we have a score for each image, each training data point, is now we can simply weight the training sets by each image by their Shafley score. Right, so that naturally teaches the algorithm to pay more attention to the data points that are more higher quality or more informative. Right, so just to be clear, this is the same training data set. Nothing has changed. We haven't spent more research to collect more data. We're simply weighting each training point by their, you know, by their value score. And this by itself actually already improves the performance quite a bit right, by, over, uh, by over 10% in deployment. Here's sort of a related example, right? Um, for other kinds of computer vision systems, there's been a lot of controversy that, for example, like facial recognition. One reason why it's so controversial is that their performance in deployment can be quite biased, especially for underrepresented minorities. And the reason for this is that a lot of the training data that's used to train these facial recognition systems, as we know here, are no, they're not representative, right? They're more enriched for, let's say, for white males. And here as well, the, what the Shapley value does is actually assigns a number, right? Maybe minus one or plus five to each of these training images to say how much that image contributes to the biases of the model in deployment, right? And again, the high value data, right? With, with higher score ends up putting, more, encouraging more uh, attention for more diverse data points or more diverse images, right? And this has also led to quite substantial improvements in the bias or in reducing the bias and improving the fairness of these models in deployment. So that's actually looking at the contributions of each individual training data, right? So the second components that I mentioned, right, of this whole accountability framework is that we also want to know how much the individual neurons in this network contribute to the success or to the mistakes of the model. Because if you can figure out which neurons are contributing, then that also makes it easy to both understand what the network's doing, maybe also to repair these models. So, and th that, that we can do now with this framework called neuron Shapley value, right? So what neuron Shapley value does is that actually assigns also a numerical score, right? To each individual neuron in the network. And the, that score itself actually tells you how much did that neuron contribute to the model's behavior. So something that's actually very interesting, uh, super, you know, quite surprising to us that we discovered in doing this is that it turned out that for many of the trained deep learning models, only a very small number of neurons are actually responsible uh, for the model's performance. Right? As an uh, illustration, right? so let's say if we actually taken this standard inceptual, inception V3 model, it has over 20,000 artificial neurons, and I trained it to actually predict active volcanoes. After I do the training, if I look at the neuron Shapley values, most of them are very close to zero. And there's only a handful, like 15, 30 of these neurons that actually have you know, positive significant values. Right? So this suggests that these are only a very sparse number of neurons that ends up being important for the model's behavior and for the predictions after I do the training. Now, before I do the training, you know, all of them are contributing, they're all random, but after I do the training, only a small number of them are actually important. And we can know this because you know, if I just remove these 15 neurons, right? so that's the axis, how many of these 15 do I remove? The model's performance on the y-axis are basically completely tankered. Right? Whereas if I remove random neurons from this trained model, then nothing really happens. Right? So this, these are really capturing the most critical neurons in that work. So this is actually a really, I think, powerful approach for accountability and for also for interpreting models. Right, because if I know there are only 15 neurons and I can quickly identify them now with neuron Shapley, I can just simply look at what are these 15 neurons are doing, right? which is you know, what, what, what we can do together in the next couple of minutes. So I'm actually showing you here 
the single most important neuron right, for this entire model for predicting active volcanoes. It's that neuron's lying on the sixth layer of this Inception V3 model. And just to visualize it, I'm showing you sort of three images that leads to the highest activation for that single neuron. Right? Again, this is the most important neuron based on the having the highest Shapti value. And here are the three natural images that most activated this single neuron. So what, what, what do we, you think that this neuron is actually doing? What do you think it's looking for? Feel free to just to shout it out or type into the chat. White. Yeah, good. Other guesses? Yeah, sort of white, white plume. Good, so it's basically looking for like white puffs, exactly, right? So the white puff could be, you know, mashed potato, or it could be fountains or clouds. So it's not too careful, right? But it's basically looking for white puffs. And the second most important neuron is on the seventh layer, right? Uh, and here are the three images that leads to the highest activation for that one. Any sharp. guesses on what this neuron is looking for? Sharp borders. Okay, or sharp borders. Any, yeah, other ideas? Horizontal borders. Yeah. Mountains, good. Yeah, so it's basically looking for like, you know, green mountains or green triangles, right? So now, now we already have a pretty good idea of what is this whole network doing, right? So it has basically the single most important component of the network is one neuron that's looking for white puffs. The next most important component is one neuron that's looking for these mountains, green mountains. They're unique. We know they're unique because if I remove any one of these two, right, the model basically collapses. And if the model finds both of them, that's how it makes prediction for volcanoes. Right, so I think that's sort of the key insight we'd learn from this analysis is that actually trained deep nets, right, they can be very complicated in their architecture, over parameterized, but after you the training, it only has a very small number of critical neurons. And we can quickly identify them right, with these neuron Shapley scores. And if we, just by interpreting what these critical neurons are doing, that gives us a good way to understand what are the potential, uh, and what the model is doing, what are the potential biases in the model. Right, so yeah, like one example of this, you know, here are some more visualizations of different networks that are trained to predict different objects. Right? And maybe just, you can just focus on the dumbbell one, right? So here I'm also showing you for the top two neurons for dumbbells, right? What leads to the most activations for those two neurons? So the top one makes sense, right? It's sort of looking for something that has that shape, that geometry. But the bottom one's a little puzzling to us in the beginning, right? Because it actually has, there's nothing to do with dumbbell here. There's no dumbbell or nothing that looked like that shape in there. So why do you people think that's, you know, one of the two most important neurons for dumbbell is actually looking for these kinds of images? Yeah, so lots of good guesses for arms, right? So this, these kind of, these are basically, especially bare arms, right? So what the model has learned is that in the training data, every time there's a dumbbell, there's actually some person actually holding the dumbbell, right? So that's actually a very strong bias in the training data sets. And the model says, okay, in that case, then that's actually a sign a particular neuron to actually look for arms, right? Can and that's I its understand? primary yeah. job. Um, and this, in this case, by interpreting these neurons, we can actually quickly identify you know, what are some of the quite fundamental biases and limitations or artifacts in this trained model. James, I think someone has a question. Was someone trying to ask a question? Yeah, James, this is Sandy. Before you go away from those slides, can you go back two slides one more? Um, I think you are very clear and I understand how you can tell which are the most important neurons. But then in trying to interpret what was important about them, this is just a bunch of human beings so far, me, you, other people in the audience giving you guesses. But how do you actually know? I mean, you know that that neuron was important, but all you can do is look at the collection of pictures that caused it to register the highest activation and try to, in our human brains, decide what it is. What if, for instance, there's a single pixel in the upper left-hand corner of each image that happened to have a volcano? And that's actually what it's seeing. Great. 
Great. So yeah, so there's, uh, I think what you're getting at is that once we identify the important neuron, right, to figure out what that neuron is actually looking for, there's a variety of complementary approaches for doing that to really quantify that. Right. So here, what we're doing just for the purpose of crowds activity is sort of the simplest approach is I show you the actual images that leads to the highest activation and all of us, we do our tea leaves reading together. I think what, what this hopes to demonstrate is that even by doing that, you can already quickly learn something about what these neurons are looking for. You can think you learned something, but you might there be are, That's right. So there are other approaches that are more quantitative that we have used and other people have developed to validate these human interpretations. Right, so for example, we published a few papers on actually automatically learning concepts. Right? So these are sort of looking across a variety of images and see what are the common concepts in those images that leads to the activation of the model or the activation of a particular neuron. Um, so this is sort of a paper that we had in Europe's uh, last year where it's called ACE or Automated Concept Extraction. So we think of the concept of potentially being a more rigorous way to characterize what are the, the high level concepts that's each neuron where the network is trying to learn. Although James, just one quick question. Um, your input image of the mountain and the you know explosion, you know, that's not white and it's not a green mountain. So I'm wondering, have you looked, are there other features, uh, other neurons that you know you are also kind of important that do refinements or something? At what point do you say you've cut enough out that you've captured all the critical identifying features for the classifier to? Yes, good question. Yeah, so here, um, I think these kinds of ablation tests, you know, is one approach we can quantify this. So mm -hmm. in this case, we see that if we just remove just 15 neurons, yeah. and then the behavior of the model is, is effectively random. Yeah. Okay. So that gives us sort of at least like a lower bound on what are the yeah. necessary um, neurons for the model okay. to perform. Okay. And, and James, um, related to that, I guess the temptation of this would be, oh, if I know the 15 most important neurons, I can remove a lot of the other neurons and still get very similar performance. But I think there's also some other work showing that when you do that, you maybe accentuate some of the biases of the model towards, so for example, it might be very good at recognizing the vast majority of volcanoes, which are green mountains with plumes on top, but there are other kinds of volcanoes that maybe aren't registered by these key neurons, but it's gonna lose those performances. What, have you looked at that? Yeah, so that's a great comment. So um, we're, that's something we're actually exploring now. It's like, how much can you go the opposite direction sort of prune away some of these neurons from the network? I guess we've been exploring, for example, like if you do identify neurons that have specific biases, like the one that's looking for an arm, that's really important. This, then it turns out that if you actually remove that neuron, that's actually quite an effective way to, uh, in real time, to repair the model and to remove some of these biases, right? It doesn't solve the problem fundamentally, but actually it does, in practice, seem to reduce these biases. Right, so yeah, so maybe I'll just wrap up here and so we can take some more questions. So hopefully this gives you a sense of, you know, a couple of recent applications uh, of computer vision uh, you know, in medical imaging that we've been quite excited about to look at temporal and spatial information. And then I think to really take it to the next level for accountable deployment, you know, I think you know, we're, this is one approach of accountability that I think is quite important as a way to really assess which, how do the individual training data and individual parts of the model contribute to the overall model's performance and even mistakes or biases. Right, so we have all of the papers and the, the codes available on our, our website as well as the data. So happy to um, happy to take some additional questions. Great, thank you, James. Let's uh, everyone unmute and applaud, James. Thank you. Uh, we're at the hour. If people need to drop off, feel free. But if other people have questions, if James, you're still free, you might be able to answer. Yeah, happy to stay on. Yeah, sure. I have a quick question regarding kind of the accuracy of the models. So you're saying that you're, when you're wetting your samples, you increase the accuracy by eight or 11% and, and at least the, the examples that you have shown, is that sufficient? I mean, uh, and is that specific to the, the groups that are, let's say not white men, so the minority groups or how did you evaluate those and are those sufficient? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, just to put these numbers in context, Right, so most of the time, like, let's say if you are developing a new algorithm, 
especially in these computer vision applications, the kinds of improvements or change in performance you see is on the orders of you know, two or three percent. It's sometimes even less. So I would say, um, the, so certainly like eight or 11 percent improvements in performance is quite substantial based on these standard benchmark analysis. Uh, it does not solve, and we, and we don't pretend that it actually really solves the full problem, right? Because even after we do that, you know, that reweighting, the model's performance on the minority population for facial recognition does improve quite a bit, right? But there's still a gap um, in the final performance, right? So it hasn't, it hasn't completely eliminated the bias. It is, I guess I would view that as, it's a, a fairly quick fix in that you don't have to collect new data and you don't have to uh, come up with a new architecture, right? So if you have already have a data set, if you already have a model, this is something that you can do immediately. Um, and oftentimes it gives you a pretty good fix uh, in real time. But still does not solve the problem. The fact that it's so biased on minorities or might not solve the problem fully. Right, so there might still be some biases, uh, but let's say the bias goes from 20% to 5%, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, a question uh, on the spatial transcriptomics uh, stuff, where you're, where you're kind of in-painting or, or generating these things. Uh, how do you envision that you could use this in downstream tasks? Because uh, I feel like you'd, you'd have to, you'd, there's a level of, of error that you'd expect in the predictions, and then maybe this would make it not useful in uh, when you when you actually want to rely on the output of this model to come to some greater truth later, um, where you should just be you know maybe doing the transcriptomics from the scratch from scratch instead of doing the HE and converting it. Um, yes, that's a good question. Um, so there are certainly many archival samples where it's just not feasible to go back and actually do the spatial transcriptomics, right? But we have the images, we don't have the samples anymore. So in those cases, right, uh, and I think that's actually maybe the most prevalent case, then I think this approach is a, you no, know, it's still quite useful, right? Because then just based on the image itself, we can still learn about the molecular level, tumor heterogeneities. Um, and then there are a lot of interesting things based on, for example, immune tumor interactions, immune infiltration, exhaustion, that we can still infer based on the generated profiles here. And I'll just say that you know uh, the algorithm does have mistakes, right? Um, but at least for these 100 genes, many of whom are the tumor markers and immune markers, so I think we have validated them across different data sets, and we think that you know, they are getting reasonable performance there. So this, it is actually extracting useful signals. Okay, I guess. But how do we avoid like the circular logic of like we 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 observe some patterns uh, in in the data that we've collected that we have well annotated, and then we apply it to some just H and E stain data, and then we we discover the same patterns that we saw in the existing data, um, even though it may not it may not exist in the in that H and E data. But but we 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 you know you know do you know do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm like uh, right. So, yes. so that's why um, in the test time or the evaluation stage of these models, we do have to evaluate them on uh, some held out external test patients. I right? just say that's okay. So this model, given a new patient's image, is actually fundamentally learning something new. It's not just recapitulating what it saw before in the training set, right? so we, which is what we did, for example, when we took the data from this external company, 10x Genomics, to validate the model. Yes, and my question is still like, like, how can we be sure? Like, I, when, when if you take that evaluation and apply it to, to uh, like, you just do external validations on on external data sets, um, how can we be sure that it's right? Though, right? I mean, then we may just have this bias in all the data sets we evaluate on. Like, wait, you know, how, how can we be sure? I mean, are, are these evaluations like done in an adversarial way where we have some sort of, um, you know, control group that it's specifically crafted to get to make sure that this model is 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 actually predicting the truth instead of just um, uh, predicting some some baseline statistics that would be uh, uh, in all the data sets that you evaluate on. You know right, I mean? like a, a, an RCT for this specific uh, model. Yeah, so you know, for some of these other experiments, uh, like for example, the Econet, we actually did do sort of a like, prospective study, right, where we actually had the clinicians that compare head to head in parallel with the model. Uh, for the spatial transcriptomics, we're actually setting up that head to head comparison 
now, right? Uh, with Tom Montine and his group to do that for some of the neuropathology images. So I think that's one way. So, so there it will actually be a head-to-head -head comparison. You have a panel of human experts to evaluate both of these and we'll have the ground truth. Okay, thanks. All right, well, let's thanks James again. Uh, if you have other questions, people feel free to email James. James, thanks very much for doing uh, this great talk at our seminar. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, have a good week. Bye-bye.